farewell, sweet earth and northern sky, forever blessed since here did lie, and here with lissom limbs did run, beneath the moon, beneath the sun. Luthien to Nuviel, more fair than mortal tongue can tell, though all to ruin fell the world, and were dissolved and backward hurled, unmade into the old abyss, yet were its making good for this, the dusk, the dawn, the earth, the sea, that Luthien for a time should be. Greetings and well met, my friends. Yoiston here, and I hope you all are doing well, wherever you are in Middle-earth. Happy Hobbit Day as well, for it is September 22nd, Bilbo and Frodo's birthday. Today we are going to finish discussing the tale of Baron and Luthien, as told in the Silmarillion, and if you haven't seen the first episode, please check that out before coming back to watch this one. I'll link it and some other related videos and articles in the description and cards above. Finally, before we get started, we just passed 200,000 subscribers, and I wanted to thank you all for the incredible support and friendship over the years. Here's to more to come. We'll talk more about the 200,000 subscriber livestream at the end of this video. For now, let us finish our discussion about Baron and Luthien and the Lay of Lathian, released from bondage. After being freed from Tol and Gowerhoth, Finrod was buried upon his Isle of Old, and it is said that he now walks with his father beneath the trees in Eldemar, meaning he was one of the only known elves to return back to life. Baron and Luthien lingered together and found some measure of peace and joy, even as the winter went by, for flowers grew where Luthien tread, and birds sang beneath the snow-clad hills, and the year changed from 465 to 466 of the First Age. But Huon returned to his master Keligorm, son of Feanor, for that is who his loyalty was with, for now, although their love between pet and master was less. A change had also come to Nargothrond, for the elven prisoners released from Tol in Gowerhoth returned to the elven kingdom. They lamented their fallen king, and told of the might of an elven maiden who freed them, while the sons of Feanor had done nothing. It seemed to the people then that Keligorm and Kurufin were only driven by treachery, so they turned their hearts once again to the rule of Orodreth, kin of Finrod. Orodreth let none slay the brothers, as the spilling of kindred blood would only bind the doom of Mandos more about them. But the sons would be given neither food nor rest, so Keligorm and Kurufin swore little love would remain between the Feanorians and the elves of Nargothrond from then on, and they left, and Huon followed after his master Keligorm. Celebrimbor, the son of Kurufin, repudiated the deeds of his father and stayed in Nargothrond. The brothers desired to go to Himring, where Maethros, their eldest brother, dwelt, and they wished to take a path through Dimbar and along the northern marches of Doriath to come to Himring by the swiftest road and avoid danger. As for Baron and Luthien, they came wandering back into the forest of Brethil, near to the borders of Doriath. Baron thought once more of his oath, and once Luthien came back to her land, he planned to depart from her. She would not hear it, saying, quote, You must choose, Baron, between these two, to relinquish the quest and your oath and seek a life of wandering upon the face of the earth, or to hold to your word and challenge the power of darkness upon its throne. But on either road I shall go with you, and our doom shall be alike. End quote. But as they spoke, Keligorm and Kurufin espied them from afar. Keligorm turned his horse and spurred it upon Baron, while Kurufin, swerving, stooped and lifted up Luthien to his saddle. But Baron leapt up from before Keligorm, upon the moving horse of Kurufin, and he took Kurufin by the throat and hurled him backward, and they fell together. The leap of Baron is renowned indeed. The horse reared and fell, and Luthien fell aside upon the grass. Baron throttled Kurufin, but his own death was near, as Keligorm rode towards him with a spear. But Huon, the loyal and kind Hound of Valinor, forsook Keligorm in that hour, and sprang upon his former master, making the horse turn aside, and the horse would not come near Baron for fear of the Hound. Keligorm cursed both animals, but Huon cared not. Luthien rose and forbade Baron from killing Kurufin. But Baron took his weapons and gear, as well as his very sharp knife, Angrist. Baron lifted Kurufin and flung him, and he bade him walk back to his noble kinsfolk, who could teach him to turn his valor to worthier use. Baron kept his horse in service of Luthien. Kurufin cursed Baron to a swift and bitter death. Kelgorm then took his brother beside him on his horse, and the brothers made to ride away. Baron turned and took no heed of what they said, but Kurufin, who was filled with shame and malice, took Kelgorm's bow and shot back as they went, aiming for Luthien. 
Huon caught this first arrow in his mouth, but Kurufin shot again, and Baron took the arrow in his breast. Huon pursued the Feanorians who fled in fear, and returning, the hound brought Luthien an herb from the forest. With the leaf, he staunched Baron's wound, and Luthien healed him with her arts and love. Thus they returned to Doriath, but Baron was still torn. He arose one morning before Luthien, and committed her to the care of Huon, and in suffering he departed northward, going through the Pass of Sirion, since Tol and Gowerhoth was no longer a threat. Baron came to the skirts of Tower Nufuin, the forest which he and his folk had once called Dorthonion and home. He looked out across the waste of Anfaglith, and saw the far peaks of Thangorodrim. Baron then dismissed Kurufin's horse, and bade him walk upon the green grass in the lands of Sirion. Alone and on the threshold of the lands of Morgoth, Baron made the song of parting, in praise of Luthien and the lights of heaven, for he thought he would have to say farewell to both love and light. Those words were spoken at the beginning of this video. Baron sang aloud, and cared not who heard, for he was desperate and looked for no escape. Luthien heard his song, however, and she sang in response, and came from the trees unlooked for. Huon had carried her once again, and they had gone back to Sauron's Isle on their way northward. There they took on the terrible forms of creatures. Huon took the wolfheim of Drauglin, the werewolf he had killed, and Luthien took on the form of Thuringwithil, the vampirous messenger of Sauron, who was accustomed to flying to Angband in such a form. Baron saw their approach and was dismayed, for he heard the voice of Tenuviel, but now thought he was deceived. But they cast off their disguises, and the elf and man met between the forest and desert. Baron was glad, but soon wished to dissuade Luthien from aiding him on his journey. Quote, Thrice now I curse my oath to Thingol, he said, and I would that he had slain me in Menegroth, rather than I should bring you under the shadow of Morgoth. End quote. But Huon spoke for a second time, giving counsel to Baron. Quote, from the shadow of death you can no longer save Luthien, for by her love she is now subject to it. You can turn from your fate and lead her into exile, seeking peace in vain while your life lasts. But if you will not deny your doom, then either Luthien, being forsaken, must assuredly die alone, or she must with you challenge the fate that lies before you, hopeless yet not certain. Further counsel I cannot give, nor may I go further on your road. But my heart forebodes that what you find at the gate I shall myself see. All else is dark to me. Yet it may be that our three paths lead back to Doriath, and we may meet before the end." End quote. Baron now knew that he could no longer seek to send Luthien away, for their dooms were one. By the counsel of Huon he took up the disguise of Drogluin, and Luthien took up her disguise once more. The eyes of Baron held a grim but clean spirit, and horror was in his glance from Luthien. The werewolf and vampire thus went to the dread fortress of Angband. They came before the dale that lay before the gate. Black chasms opened beside the road, and forms of writhing serpents issued forth. The cliffs stood as embattled walls. Carrion fowl sat upon them and cried with fell voices. Above the gate rose a thousand feet of precipice of Thangorodrim. One guard sat before the gates, for Morgoth knew of Huon and the doom of the Hound, that he should be slain by the mightiest wolf that walked the earth. Thus by his own hand Morgoth had fed one of the whelps of Draugwin, until he became mighty and huge indeed, and he was sent to guard the gates unsleeping. Karkaroth, the Red Maw, or Unfoglir, the Jaws of Thirst. Knowing that it had been reported that Draugwin was dead, Karkaroth denied them entry, and he found something strange about them. Then Luthien cast aside her disguise and commanded him to sleep, and through her powers, he slept. Then the two went through the gate and down the labyrinthine stairs to commit the greatest deed ever dared by the two races of elves or men. They came to the seat of Morgoth in his hall. Baron slunk in wolf's form beneath the throne, but Luthien was stripped of her disguise by the will of the Dark Lord, and he bent his gaze upon her. She was not daunted, and offered her name and service to sing before him. Morgoth conceived an evil lust, and a design more dark than any that had come into his heart since leaving Valinor. But he was deceived, and watched her a while, taking pleasure in his dark thought. But then she eluded his sight, and from the shadows came a song of such loveliness and power that a blindness came upon him. Then the Silmarils in his crown blazed forth with a radiance of white flame. 
and the crown grew heavy, and Luthien, catching up her winged cloak, jumped into the air, with her voice still singing. She cast her cloak before his eyes, and he fell into a dark sleep. Then he fell from his throne, and the iron crown rolled, echoing from his head, and all was still as this moment of fate was come. Luthien awoke the wolf who was barren, and he cast off his wolf hame. Then he drew the knife Angrist, and cut a Silmaril from the iron claws that held it within the crown. The Silmaril suffered his touch, and did not hurt him, even though he was mortal, and the radiance showed through his hand, which had become a lamp. But the thought came to him to bear not one, but all three of the Silmarils from Angband, and this thought led him to attempt to cut another Silmaril from the crown. But the knife broke, and a shard of the blade flew and smote the cheek of Morgoth. He groaned and stirred, and all of the host of his hall came to move and sleep. Fear came to Baron and Luthien, and they fled without disguise. They were not hindered nor pursued, but Karkaroth at the gate had risen from sleep, and now stood in wrath upon the threshold of Angband. Luthien's power was spent, and Baron strode before her, and held aloft the Silmaril in his right hand. The dread wolf halted, and for a moment was afraid. Baron told him to be gone, claiming that the Silmaril was a fire that would consume the wolf and all evil things. Thus he thrust the Silmaril before the eyes of the wolf. Kakaroth looked upon the jewel and was not daunted, and his devouring spirit flourished. Thus he bit off Baron's hand at the wrist and took the Silmaril, but all of his innards were filled with a flame of anguish as he swallowed it. He ran out before them, howling and crazed, slaying all living things before him lest they fled before his coming. His terror came from the north into Beleriand, and it was most dreadful, for the wolf had the power of the Silmaril within him, and fate guided him. Baron fainted before the gate, and death came for him, as there was venom on the fangs of the wolf. Luthien drew the venom out of the wound with her lips, and put forth her failing power to staunch the wound, but behind her the host of Morgoth awoke. As hope failed, ere the armies of Morgoth came to the two lovers, Help came unlooked for from the skies. Baron was a friend of all good birds and beasts, so good creatures had been noised of Baron's need, and Huan had bidden all things to watch if he needed aid. Thus the great eagles of Manwe led by Thorondor came, and saw the madness of the wolf and Baron's fall. So they flew swiftly. They lifted the two from the earth and bore them into the clouds. They carried them high, to where the sun and moon were ever seen and unhindered and they were carried southward, even as the Thangorodrim erupted. They passed over Dur Nu Fauglith, Tower Nu Fuin, and even above the hidden valley of Tumladen, where was the beautiful city of Gondolin, unburdened with clouds. Luthien saw all of this, but Baron spoke no word, nor opened his eyes, and he knew nothing thereafter of his flight. And so the eagles brought them to the borders of Doriath, and they were come to the same dell whence Baron had left Luthien who had been asleep. The eagles set them there and returned to their eyries on the peaks of the Cressigrim. Huon came to Luthien, and together they tended Baron. He walked upon the edge of death, but eventually awoke and saw that it was spring again, and it was the year 466. Baron took the name Erchamion, the one-handed, and after he was drawn back to life by the love of Luthien, they walked together in the woods once again. They took their time, and Luthien was content to wander forever, but Baron could not long forget his oath, nor would he hold Luthien from her father for too long. And he felt Luthien should not always live in the woods as the hunters among men do, so he persuaded her to return to Menegroth. But since Luthien's departure from the kingdom of her father, grief and silence had come among its people. Dairon the minstrel went east from the land, for he had loved Luthien and made music for her before the coming of Baron. Dairon was named the greatest of all minstrels of the elves east of the sea, and he wandered over the mountains to the east, and made lament for fair Luthien beside waters dark for ages to come. In such a time as this, Thingol turned to Melion, but she withheld her counsel from him, saying that the fate he had devised must come to its end. However, Thingol had learned that Luthien had gone far from Doriath, by secret messages from Kelegorm. These messages said that Finrod and Baron were dead, but Luthien was in Nargothrond, and Kelegorm would wed her. Thingol was wrathful, and sent spies forth, thinking to make war upon Nargothrond. Then he learned Luthien fled again, 
and the sons of Fëanor were driven from Nargothrond, and Thingol was in doubt, for he could not make war on the Seven Sons. But he sent messengers to Hemring, asking the Feanorians for aid in seeking his daughter, for Caligorm had not sent her back to Doriath, nor kept her safely. But the messengers came unknowingly into the onslaught of Karkaroth, as nothing hindered him and the girdle of Melion upon the borders of Doriath did not keep him away. But Mablong, one of Thingol's messengers, had escaped, and brought evil tidings to Thingol. In that hour, Baron and Luthien returned, and the news of their coming went forth like a song, and a great host followed them to the gates of Menegroth. Baron led Luthien before the throne of her father, and he looked in wonder at Baron, who he thought was dead. Still, Thingol was not fond of the men who had brought perils to Doriath. Baron knelt and said he returned according to his word, and came now to claim his own. Thingol asked of the quest and vow. Baron said it was fulfilled, for Silmaril was indeed in his hand. Thingol told him to show it to him, and Baron extended his left arm and opened that hand, which held not. And then he held up his right arm and named himself Camlost, the Empty-Handed. Thingol's mood was softened, and Baron sat before his throne upon the left and Luthien upon the right, and they told their tale of the quest for the Somoril. All were filled with amazement, and Thingol realized the greatness of Baron among men. Thus he yielded, and Baron took the hand of Luthien before the throne. But a shadow fell upon Doriath, for now the people knew the cause of the madness coming from the north, as Kakaroth made his way towards Menegroth daily. And so the hunting of the wolf was prepared and of any pursuit of a beast, that was the most perilous. Baron saw that his quest was not yet fulfilled. Upon this hunt went Huon, Mablong, and Beleg, greatest of the servants of Thingol, Baron, and Thingol himself. They rode forth in the morning and passed over the river as Galdween, and Luthien remained at the gates. A dark shadow fell upon her, and it seemed that the sun had sickened and turned black. They turned east and north until they came upon the wolf in a dark valley. The river fell in a torrent over steep falls, and Karkaroth drank and howled, but he espied them and controlled his wrath and lay in hiding. They set a guard about the area, and the shadows lengthened. Baron stood beside Thingol, and they were aware that Huon left their side. A great baying awoke in the thicket as Huon went to dislodge Karkaroth. Then Karkaroth leapt suddenly upon Thingol, but Baron strode before him with a spear, which Karkaroth swept aside before biting his breast. Huon leapt from the thicket upon the back of the wolf, and they fought bitterly. Within Huon and his voice were the horns of Arome and the wrath of the Valar, but within Karkaroth was the hate and malice of Morgoth. Rocks were rent by their clamor, and fell from high and choked the falls of Asgaldwin. Thingol gave no heed, and saw Baron was very wounded. Huon slew Karkaroth, but at this time his own doom was fulfilled, as the venom of Morgoth entered into him. He came and fell beside Baron. Huon spoke for a third and final time, and bade his friend Baron farewell before he died. Baron laid his hand upon the head of Huon, and so they parted in friendship. Mablong and Beleg hastened to the king's aid, and saw what had happened. They cast aside their spears and wept. Mablong took a knife and ripped open the wolf. Within, he had been consumed indeed by flame, but the hand of Baron held the Silmaril. When Mablong went to touch it, the hand was no more, and the Silmaril was recovered, as the light filled the shadows of the forest. Mablong put it in Baron's living hand, and he held it aloft and gave it to Thingol. Quote, now is the quest achieved, he said, and my doom full wrought. And he spoke no more. End quote. They bore Baron Camlost, son of Barahir, and who on the hound of Valinor upon a bier of branches, and came back to Menegroth in the night. At the feet of the tree Hirolorn, Luthien met them, and some bore torches beside the bier. Luthien set her arms about Baron, kissing him and telling him to await her beyond the western sea. He looked upon her eyes ere his spirit left. But darkness fell upon Luthien. So ended the quest for the Silmaril, but indeed not this tale, nor the lay of Lathian, for Luthien eventually perished, and her body lay like a cut flower. A winter and sorrow fell upon Thingol. Luthien came to the halls of Mandos, the place of death for the Eldalie, beyond the mansions of the west and upon the edge of the world where the souls of the Eldar sat in waiting. My words here, even paraphrased as they are and have been throughout this tale, 
cannot do this justice as the professor did, as it spins all dooms together and it is perhaps the heart of Tolkien's works that lay here. So I will read from the Silmarillion directly. Quote, but her beauty was more than their beauty, and her sorrow deeper than their sorrows, and she knelt before Mandos and sang to him. The song of Luthien before Mandos was the song most fair that ever in words was woven, and the song most sorrowful that ever the world shall hear. Unchanged, imperishable, it is sung still in Valinor beyond the hearing of the world, and listening the Valar are grieved. For Luthien wove two themes of words, of the sorrow of the Eldar and the grief of men, of the two kindreds that were made by Iluvatar to dwell in Arda, the kingdom of earth amid the innumerable stars. And as she knelt before him, her tears fell upon his feet like rain upon the stones, and Mandos was moved to pity, who never before was so moved, nor has been since. Therefore he summoned Baron, and even as Luthien had spoken in the hour of his death, they met again beyond the Western Sea. But Mandos had no power to withhold the spirits of men that were dead within the confines of the world, after their time of waiting, nor could he change the fates of the children of Iluvatar. He went therefore to Manwe, lord of the Valar who governed the world under the hand of Iluvatar, and Manwe sought counsel in his inmost thought, where the will of Iluvatar was revealed. These were the choices that he gave to Luthien. Because of her labors and her sorrow, she should be released from Mandos and go to Valimar, there to dwell until the world's end among the Valar, forgetting all griefs that her life had known. Thither Baron could not come, for it was not permitted to the Valar to withhold death from him, which is the gift of Iluvatar to men. But the other choice was this, that she might return to Middle-earth and take with her Baron, there to dwell again, but without certitude of life or joy. Then she would become mortal, and subject to a second death, even as he, and ere long she would leave the world forever, and her beauty become only a memory and song. This doom she chose, forsaking the blessed realm, and putting aside all claim to kinship with those that dwell there, that thus whatever grief might lie in wait, the fates of Baron and Luthien might be joined, and their paths lead together beyond the confines of the world. So it was that alone of the Eldalie she has died indeed, and left the world long ago. Yet in her choice the two kindreds have been joined, and she is the forerunner of many in whom the Eldar see yet, though all the world is changed, the likeness of Luthien the Beloved, whom they have lost." End quote. Thus Baron and Luthien returned to life in 467 of the First Age. They would return to Doriath, and those that saw them were both glad and fearful. Luthien healed the winter of Thingol with the touch of her hand, but Melian looked in Luthien's eyes and saw her new doom, and she knew that a parting beyond the end of the world had come between them, and no grief of loss was heavier than the grief of Melian the Maya in that hour. In 469, Baron and Luthien would go to Middle-earth to live in Dorfern Iguinar, the land of the dead that live, and no mortal man would ever speak to Baron again, nor would anyone see Baron and Luthien leave the world nor know where their bodies lay. They would have a child, Dior, who would be Thingol's heir after the sack of Menegroth and the death of Thingol. Inside the Legendarium, the tale of Baron and Luthien did much. It would inspire Maethros to create a union against Morgoth, for it was known that it was possible to assail him, as this tale told. And the deeds of Baron also opened Thingol's heart to the kindred of men, for he would foster Turin in his halls for a time. And of course, this tale would be recalled in the tale of Aragorn and Arwen. This would not be the last time we read of Baron and Luthien either, for they were yet bound to the Somaril, for it would cause the death of Thingol, and Baron's fighting against the dwarves alongside Green Elves and Ents to avenge Thingol and recover the Somaril. But all of this shall be discussed later in my timeline of Arda series. For now, however, we have come to the end of the tale of Baron and Luthien and the Lay of Lathian. Even beyond the works, this tale inspired much, and in my mind it is the heart of the Legendarium because upon the graves of J.R.R. Tolkien and his wife Edith are written the names Baron and Luthien. In life, Edith was indeed the Luthien to Tolkien's Baron, and they remain together even now. From this part of the tale of Baron and Luthien, we see the power of unfettered love. Not even the bonds of death and fate nor oaths and curses could break the love and connection between Baron and Luthien. 
Thank you all so much for watching, it really means a lot. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button and share this with a friend. What are your thoughts on this part of the tale of Baron and Luthien? This tale overall is one of my favorites and has some examples of the best writing I've ever read within it. Let me know any thoughts, questions, additions, and corrections in the comments below. For further lore and information on this story, please check out The Silmarillion, as well as the novel Baron and Luthien. Also, please check out my videos on the tale of the children of Hurin and the tale of the fall of Gondolin that I have made, and consider looking at the novels concerning these great tales. Finally, please check out our music channel, Facebook, Twitter, Merch, and Patreon for our Discord server and podcasts. Links for those are in the description below. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell button to join the men of the West and all of the free peoples today, and I will see you all again next Sunday from 5 to 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for a 200,000 subscriber Lord of the Rings online livestream. Once again, thank you all so much for the support. It means the world to me, and it has really made my dream of telling Tolkien's stories on YouTube a reality. Thank you all so much for joining me on this adventure, and all past adventures. Until the next one, my great friends.